We're going to continue our series. This is week three of New Thing. As we are working through the book of Acts together, we're in Acts chapter 3 still. We're going to get out of it in a couple of weeks, but we're still in Acts chapter 3 in New Thing. And the new thing that we're talking about is the church. So the book of Acts is talking about the birth of a brand new thing, or the meta title of this work through Acts is the movement. It's a brand new movement, a brand new thing called the church. And there are new things happening, new leaders emerging, uh, new miracles that are taking place that people haven't seen before. Uh, unless they saw Jesus do some of them, they only heard about them, but now they're seeing them and even being a part of them. And so we're in the middle of Acts 3, so let's do a brief recap to get us caught up to where we're just going to pick up uh, here in the middle of Acts 3. So Peter and John are on their way to pray at the temple in the afternoon, and they see a man, a, a lame beggar, who is at this gate begging for his, for his life. That's what he does. And as they're there, the Holy Spirit does something to them, speaks something to them, and they declare to this man, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And instantly, by the power of Jesus, this man is healed. But then as we talked about the week after, Peter used this miracle as an opportunity to tell people about Jesus. Because he says, we didn't do this. Our power didn't make this miracle happen. It's the power in the name of Jesus that healed this man. And then he doesn't just say that he did this for this man, but Peter really says, and we'll see it today, that Jesus also did something for you. And he wants to do something for you. And so he talks to the crowd and says that, as we'll talk about today, Jesus wants to make you a new person. So it's more than just the miracle. The miracle is kind of the bait that got the people's attention. But now Peter says the real power of Jesus is not just that he can heal, but that he wants to make you a new person. And then next week, we'll finish up Acts 3, this sermon basically from Peter, as he says, not only does Jesus want to make you a new person, but he wants to offer you a new way of life. So that'll be next week, new life, but today is new person. So what we'll look at today for a few minutes is what does it mean to be a new person? What does Peter tell us is involved in becoming a new person? So we'll focus on two key words that Peter gives us in the first, or kind of the middle section here of this sermon in Acts chapter 3. We'll sort of look, look at what life looked like before someone is a new person, what it looks like before, and then what it takes to become that new person. That's kind of what we'll focus on today with two key words here in Acts chapter 3. The first key word that we'll focus on this morning that Paul talks about, or Peter, I'm sorry, we'll talk about Paul, but Peter preaches this. The first word that Peter mentions here is ignorance. Ignorance. This word describes life before being a new person or what the old person was. They were ignorant. There's ignorance. So we're going to pick it up at Acts chapter 3, verse 17, kind of in the middle here of his sermon. Acts 3, 17 and 18, Peter again says this, Friends, I realize that what you and your leaders did to Jesus was done in ignorance. So he's just gotten through telling them, Hey, you murdered an innocent man just a couple months ago. You did that. You maybe weren't here responsible for that physically, but he'll get into the spiritual aspect of that. But he says, I realize that what you and your leaders did to Jesus was done in ignorance, but God was fulfilling what all the prophets had foretold about the Messiah, that he must suffer these things. Skip down to verse 22, Acts 3.22. Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. Listen carefully to everything he tells you. Then Moses said, anyone who will not listen to that prophet will be completely cut off from God's people. Starting with Samuel, every prophet spoke about what is happening today. The first key word there that we saw in verse 17, Peter says, is ignorance. And there's really, as we'll look at for a little bit, two types of ignorance that we all live with or deal with. The first kind of ignorance is like actual true ignorance. Someone really does not know something. So there was a story of a, a police officer that pulled over this old station wagon on the highway. I mean, they were speeding hardcore through town. So the officer pulls them over, gets out, and as he walks to the driver's side window, is astonished that the car is full of nuns. And he's thinking, 
this doesn't seem right. They were, they were like hightailing it, and this does not seem right. So he walks over to the driver and says, um, sister, did you realize that you were speeding quite a bit just now? That's why I pulled you over. He said, no, I'm going exactly the speed limit, like exactly the speed limit. And he says, well, no, ma'am, uh, you were going 78 in a 40. Oh. And she says, no, 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 it's 78 miles an hour. And she points to the sign. He says, oh, ma'am, that's the highway sign. You're on Highway 78. The speed limit is right up there. It's 40, right? So then he looks in the back to see the other nuns in the back, and they look like they've seen a ghost. They are terrified. And he's like, is something going on? So he says, he says, sisters, is there something wrong? Are you okay? And they said, we're fine. We just got off Highway 127. Okay? So... The driver was ignorant, right? Actual ignorance. You guys like that one. That's good. That one hit hard. Yes. <laughs> Love it when that happens. She was ignorant, right? She really actually literally messed up the sign. She thought something that was not true. It was actual ignorance. Peter, to the people in Acts 3, says, Yes, you murdered Jesus, but I know it was done in ignorance. Even Jesus on the cross, some of his final words echo this same sentiment, don't they? Some of the final words of Jesus are, Father, forgive them. Why? They know not what they do. They're ignorant. So what Peter and Jesus both say here, what they see is that the people didn't really know they were really killing God's son. They really didn't know they were really killing their Messiah who was sent for them. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says the same thing. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8, Paul writes about the gospel. He says, no, the wisdom we speak of is the mystery of God. His plan that was previously hidden, even though he made it for our ultimate glory before the world began. But catch this, verse 8, but the rulers of this world have not understood it. If they had, they would not have crucified our glorious Lord. So Paul in 1 Corinthians 2, Peter in Acts 3, even Jesus on the cross attributes a great amount of ignorance to the crucifixion of Jesus. True ignorance. But there's a second type of ignorance as well, and it's a little bit different, and maybe you can relate to this too. It's what I'm going to call willful ignorance. And really, it puts the ignore in ignorance. It's that I, I really do have some, at least somewhat of an idea that this thing is the wrong thing to do, but I'm going to do it anyway. So it's not like the nun driving the car in ignorance. It's like I see the speed limit sign. I know what it says. I see the cop right there. I'm still going to blow right past him in willful ignorance, hoping or assuming that I won't get pulled over. Willful ignorance. So Peter says, he does say, you didn't know it was ignorance, but then what he goes on to say is, you should have known. You should have known. He says, from Moses to Samuel and every prophet since has pointed to Jesus. I've mentioned this before, but there's, there's a sort of a span of how many Old Testament prophecies about Jesus there are. So conservatively, there are 325 on the high end. If you kind of split some out into more than one, there's over 400. Let's just go conservative. Over about 325 distinct prophecies from the Old Testament about the Messiah. And Jesus fulfills all of them. We've mentioned this before, but the odds of one person fulfilling even 25 to 30 of these prophecies is like 1 times 10 to the 80th power. And we're talking like times six, times seven, Jesus fulfills all of them. He came for the people that rejected him. So Peter says, maybe you could say, I didn't know. We didn't know. We were ignorant. But he says, no, really what you were doing was la, 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 la. Right? It's not that you didn't know. It's that you didn't want to know. You, you kind of knew what you were doing. You kind of had an inkling of who Jesus really was. You kind of knew that what he's saying lines up with all these things that I've been reading my entire life, and yet I'm just going to refuse to believe. I'm going to willfully ignore what I'm seeing, what I'm experiencing, what I'm hearing, what he's doing. 
I want plausible deniability, you might say. What's interesting here, we'll get into Old Testament law for just one second because I, I found this fascinating. If you go to Numbers chapter 15, really Peter's argument that doesn't have to be stated here that the people would know is that it doesn't matter according to their own law. It wouldn't matter if it was willful ignorance or actual ignorance. Any sin that is committed against God still must be punished. Now, they, if you read Numbers 15 there in the middle of that chapter, uh, there's a section there that talks about basically you sin without really knowing it's a sin. The Old Testament law says that is still punishable by the law. If you didn't, if you didn't know or did know but still committed that sin, the Old Testament law would say it is still sin that is still punished. And so Peter was telling the crowd what they kind of already knew. Either way, you're still guilty of his blood. You're still culpable for what you did, even if you want to claim it was done in ignorance. Now, even if we don't like to admit it, most sin that we see and that we commit is the second type of ignorance, if we're honest, right? It's willful ignorance. And you can look at just on a natural, we don't have to get spiritual yet, just on a natural level, we know physiologically that things that the Bible would call sin, we just know there's a negative aspect and outcome to those things on a natural level. Most sin that you can think of is physically harmful to someone in some way. Sin has an emotionally damaging effect over time to someone in some way. Sin destroys relationships over time. Sin exhibits selfish behavior, which is, an, which is not a noble way of living. Sin goes against the natural order of how the world was designed. And that's what Paul gets into really in the first three chapters of Romans. In Romans 1, he talks about that, you know, we're sinful, but he says that we're all without excuse for our sin. And the reason that he says that is in Romans 1, he goes in great, to great lengths to say, God has made it clear through creation, through the natural world, and over time, how the world is designed to work and how humans are designed to function. God has made it clear without even having to communicate directly by words or by print, right? Just through the natural world, he shows us how everything's supposed to work. And that's where this uh, Hebrew word shalom really comes from. We typically think of shalom as just, well, that means peace. And it does mean that, but really the idea of shalom is activity that is mutually, that promotes mutual human flourishing. I mentioned that previous sermons and series years ago. But this idea of shalom is not just peace, that's just a blanket statement. But no, shalom is really a way of interacting with others that promotes mutual human flourishing. And so any activity, any action, any word that goes outside of that sort of activity would then be sin because it's not shalom. We have these two options in how we live, either shalom, mutual human flourishing, or sin outside of that. And Paul says in Romans 1 that uh, we are without excuse because God's made it clear which of those we're doing pretty much all the time. So if we do it, it's willful ignorance. And then in Romans, uh, he furthers, further down in Romans 2, he talks about, again, talking mainly to Jews in chapter 1, and then he flips it back and forth. He kind of, he just destroys everybody in the book of Romans, okay? <laughs> Everyone's guilty, which he gets to in chapter 3. But in Roman, Romans chapter 2, Paul says that even the Gentiles, which would be, if you're not a Jew, okay, that would be you, even Gentiles without God's written law know that that's true. They can look at the natural world and see how God designed certain things to work in a certain way, including us. And so anything outside of that would then be sin, even if it's ignorance or willful ignorance. And then he drops the hammer again, Romans 3, everyone has sinned. All have sinned and fall short of God's glory. No one is righteous, not even one. We're all without excuse. And so when you, when you put all this together, sin really puts us in quite a predicament, doesn't it? Like, Mentally, emotionally, relationally, spiritually, it just destroys everything, whether it's real ignorance or willful ignorance. It really puts us in a bind. But can I just tell you how good God is anyway, despite that? Here's how good God is. God is so good, he can use our ignorance and stupidity for his glory. Man, that's good news. Anybody else need to hear that today? God is so good 
He can use our ignorance and stupidity. I'm going to say that that's willful ignorance, is stupidity, okay? God can use our ignorance and stupidity for his glory. Isaiah 46, verse 10. This is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah. God says, only I can tell you the future before it even happens. Now catch this. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. God is so good. He can use your ignorance and stupidity for his glory. Here's what that means. Your stupidity isn't too stupid to mess up God's plan. Whoa. You're not that good, right? You're not, you're not that powerful. Your biggest mess up can't mess up what God's doing. That's good news. That's good news. God is sovereign. His plan cannot be stopped, canceled, aborted, thwarted, none of that. He says, I do what I want. Everything I will comes to pass. That good news, though, does lead to a question that we'll explore for just a second. If that is true, if even our ignorance, even our stupidity, even our sin, even if that can be used for God's glory, even if nothing that we do can upset God's plan, then why am I still culpable for my ignorance? If it's true that even my sin can be used, then why am I guilty for my sin? Let me give you a case study, uh, a guy named Judas. Explore this question. So Judas is one of the 12 disciples chosen by Jesus, yet we, uh, if you don't know this, spoiler alert, Judas is the one that betrays Jesus and hands him over to the authorities where then he's killed the following day. So uh, here's the question. If if God's plan can't be stopped, and if, if the plan of salvation includes the death of Jesus, then why isn't Judas the good guy in the story? Why is he not... Yeah, Judas, you did your part. You played your part. You did your thing. It's, it, Isaiah 53, it was God's plan to crucify his son. That's the whole point of the whole story of everything, is that that's the only way we can be saved from our sins. So Judas was just a pawn in the game. He was just doing his part, right? But why is he the bad guy? Why did he feel guilt? Why did he kill himself over this grief from this account? And what it comes down to is that, yes, God used even the betrayal of Judas as part of the cosmic plan of salvation, but that does not excuse Judas's personal decision of betrayal. It doesn't make what he did right. Judas was still personally responsible for his personal decisions, even if God somehow used that decision for good to come from it. I know that's kind of murky and that's kind of weird and that that may not sit well with you, but let's just sit with that for a little bit and and understand this. Let me just bring it into our current day and this will maybe make it easier to uh, understand. If, if this is true, again, if God is so good, he can use my ignorance and stupidity for his glory, then why wouldn't I just want to sin even more all the time? I'm just trying to help God out, right? I'm trying to be as stupid as possible because I want his will to be so good. Like, no one thinks that way. So it doesn't go with Judas either. Did God use what Judas did to fulfill his plan? Yes, because God is sovereign. He's above time and space. His will cannot be stopped. But still, our personal decisions, we are then personally responsible for. And here's what it comes, as we get into then the second word, ignorance. Here's the thing. God can use our sin, our mess-ups, our issues, our stupidity, our ignorance. He can use those. Okay, what that means is he's using us in spite of ourselves. But God's heart is he wants more for us than that. He doesn't just want to use you despite yourself. He wants his plan to actually work for you, not despite you. But to get that desired result of God is, requires the second word that Peter mentions in, in Acts 3, and that is repentance. Acts 3.19, Peter says, Now repent of your sins And turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Again, in our ignorance, in our sin, God's plan is working despite us. But God wants his plan to work for us. In us. Through us. And that's what I think Paul has in mind when he writes Romans 8, 28. He says, we know God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. 
There's a difference there, right? It's not that God's working out things out in spite of me, but for me, for the good, but of who? Of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. What Peter would say is those who have turned from their sin and turned to God. They've repented of their sin. That's who this works for. It's a new person. And Peter says the way to do that is to go from ignorance to repentance. That key part in there is he says, repent of your sins and turn to God. So I'm turning from my sin to God. I'm facing a totally different direction now. Before it was all about what I want, my, my will, my desires, my ways, even if they're sinful and apart from God's shalom way of the world working, I'm going to turn from that and turn to God. That's what repentance is. It requires that turning. So here, here let me show you an example of something. I have some of our china here, our wedding china, okay? I know, I know, I know. This is real, okay, this is our china. I have, I have a bunch of it here. So what does it look like? Here, I'll, I'll even, I'll show you some of it here for a second. Yep. Whew, this is really nerve-wracking. Nope, no, I'm good. So this is, see, this is real. You nervous? Are you nervous? We've never used it in 16, 17 years, so I don't know why we care if something happens to it. Maybe one day we'll use it. I think actually some of you used like some of our cups for a ladies' tea at the church. I never got to use any of these, but some of you have, so you're welcome for that. Enjoy my wedding gift from 17 years ago. Um, huh? We well, if I don't break them, we will. We will. I'm just I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Oh man, you're gonna hate me. So, he, remember we're turning we're turning from sin, turning to God. That's what repentance is. I'm changing directions. So what does it look like, though, if I want to try to sort of turn to God but not turn from my sin? It's kind of like if we actually had a china cabinet and we were going to, let's say we were going to display it in the china cabinet. And I'm getting stuff out of the box and I'm going to then take it and carefully hand it to Kim. I'm going to turn to Kim so she can then put it. And if she drops it, it's not on me. Okay, right? So, I, but... If I'm gonna, if I'm gonna put, if, if the desired effect of putting that all in, in, in its proper place and not chipped or broken happens, I have to turn from this box to Kim so she can put that away correctly, right? So if I try to not turn to her, but I wanna put stuff away, it'd be like, here, Kim. Here. Here, Kim. Kim just had a heart attack. That was fake. It was a prop. I, was, I shouldn't have thrown, given that away yet, but anyway. Did you believe me for a second? Oh, slash ignorant. I wasn't that ignorant, she said. Yeah. So if I tried to not turn from this to that, I, di I didn't buy flimsy enough stuff. I tried to buy cheap stuff so it would break, but it didn't break. So anyway, at the very least... It's not going to get on the shelf where it's supposed to. At the worst, it's going to be shattered and broken all over the floor. I've got to turn from this to this direction to get the desired result. So if I don't turn from my sin and try to turn to God, that's not going to work. I'm still trying to face this direction, facing my sin without turning to him. That's not repentance. Peter makes it clear. Turn from your sin, repent, and turn to God. So we have to do both of these. It doesn't work if we don't turn away to turn to something else. Really what that is, if we try to live that way, is we're using God to try to get a desired result. I want the benefit of the china cabinet, but I don't want to turn from this other thing. I, I want the eternal life part, but I don't want the, rep the repent from sin part. It doesn't work. It's a turn from to get a turn to. It's, it's a full 180 degree action on our part to truly repent. But here's what happens when we do turn from sin and turn to God. This is 1 John 1, verses 8 and 9. Here's what John says. If we do turn, he says, If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. So that's ignorance. It's the first word. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Confessing is turning. I'm turning from my sin, turning to God. 
So what John says, if I don't confess my sin, I haven't turned. And what Peter says, if I haven't turned from sin, I haven't repented. I'm trying to use the benefits of God without declaring my allegiance to him and him only. Trying to live this way is fooling myself, John says. Trying to live this way is still living in ignorance, Peter would say. But if I confess and turn, I'm forgiven. Turning from sin, here's maybe the hard part. There's two parts of this that are hard. Turning from sin is a daily lifelong process it's a daily lifelong series of decisions every day i make this decision i'm gonna turn to god every day all the time so life is sort of like a turntable okay so every day when i wake up my natural human inclination is to turn back to my sin it's natural for me to want to turn back to what's easy and comfortable and sinful and pleasurable and those things, but that's not the way of God. So every day I have to make that decision, I'm going to turn back to him. M- maybe I got off course 15 degrees, to, I'm going to turn toward the other direction, back to God. It's, again, our natural, and so here's the thing, we don't always feel like doing that. That's why I said it's a decision that we make. I don't, yes, this would be... <laughs> It was, this would seem better or seem more fun or give me more happiness in the short term, but now I want to turn toward God, turn away from my sin. So I have to keep turning. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, I die daily. Paul, Paul, I die daily. I'm figuring I'm going to have to do kind of what he did, right? I'm going to have to do the same thing. Jesus, in Luke 9, 23, the call to discipleship, he catch this, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Daily. Daily, we have to die to ourselves. Now, there is that moment of decision, and many of you celebrated that with baptisms last week. There is that moment where I'm turning from my sin, I'm confessing my sin, and now I'm his. We'll get to that in just a second. But then after that, right, that's just day one of turning. Every day now is a turn. It's a turn. Because, again, my natural human inclination is to go back this way. But no, 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 no. It's not what I want. I don't want to use God for his benefits. I want to actually love him and serve him. So I'm going to turn to him. I'm going to resist what seems natural and turn to him. And we'll never get it right every time, every day, okay? Which is why what we said earlier is still true. God can still use our ignorance and stupidity for his glory. Because Christians still sin, right? Anybody? Yeah? Okay. You drive. You're in traffic. You know, right? You've been there (laughs) on one end or the other of that, right? We don't always feel like it, but it's a series of daily decisions for the rest of our life. But here's the key, and then we'll look at a couple scriptures and we'll be done. Living with that understanding that, yeah, I know, but I got to turn. Yeah, I know. Living with that understanding, living with that sensitivity, living in that tension of reality means that you're that new person, Because you sense that pull. You sense that tension. You know that there's something off that he can make right if I turn back to him. That's one of the hallmarks of proof that you are that new person. Because when I confess, John says, I'm forgiven and cleansed. But here's one other cool thing. Let's look, we've looked at this from our perspective for a second. Let's look at this from God's perspective as we close. Now that you're a new person, how does God see you? Here's what Paul says, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who had no sin, Jesus, to be sin for us on the cross so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So even the best, most faithful, most dedicated follower of Jesus probably still sees themselves as a sinner. I'm a work in progress, I'm imperfect, I don't measure up, I've fallen short. Even yesterday, I, you could list the, th- the sins that you committed yesterday, the things that you, know, you even did on the way to church today that you're not proud of. That's how even the best follower of Jesus probably sees themselves. But Paul says, God sees you as the righteousness of his son. So you're consumed with guilt all the time you're consumed with all these things that you did that and i'm trying to turn and it's really hard and sometimes i don't want to and sometimes i don't and sometimes i'm a mess and god's like you're a new person so now i see you as the righteousness of my own sinless son that's a big deal god doesn't you see the end it's it's almost like uh social media 
you see everyone's highlight reel, you see their vacation photos, you see all the good news, but you don't live with them every day to see the life that they deal with. Like, we see the life that we deal with, God's just scrolling through heaven Facebook. Man, look at that, they're doing so great. Oh, and they're a new person, I love them. Look at all the great things that they're doing in my name. Look at how they're loving me and serving me and being as faithful as they can to me. That's how God sees you as a new person in Christ, is as the righteousness of Christ. But that last part's important, the righteousness of Christ. It's not our righteousness. It's not our works because we didn't do anything to earn that status. All we did was receive the gift that God offered to us through his son to then become that new person and be seen as the righteousness of Christ. It's a big deal. One more scripture as we close. Because we've repented of our ignorance and turned from sin to God, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, just a few verses up. Paul says this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. There it is. We took all day to get to it, but there it is. They become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. If you are in Christ, you're a new person. That's what baptism, again, from last week is. The old person going in, They're gone. They're dead. It's over. I'm raised to new life in Christ. That's what that is. We're a new person. And again, I will say, you may not always feel like a new person. You may be kicking yourself for all sorts of things and all and whatever. That's part of that turning. I'm aware of my sin. I'm aware that I'm straying and turning, but I'm turning toward him. That's what this whole life is, this tug of war, this struggle within us. But that's why this is positional, not emotional. Okay? It's positional, not emotional. This decision that you've made to follow Jesus, or maybe the decision that you'll make here in a moment to follow Jesus is not an emo. I feel like it. I feel like the righteousness of Christ all the time. No, you don't, and you won't, and you can't. But it's positional. That is how God sees you if you're in Christ as a new person. And as we'll get to next week, you're a new person who's now designed to live a new life. And we'll finish uh, Acts chapter 3 with that idea next week. So let me ask you uh, this question to go back to Acts 3. Have you repented of your ignorance? Your ignorance to God's ways? Your ignorance to God's design and desire for you? If you have, let me encourage you, walk in that newness of life. Know that you are a new person. Live in that assurance and live out that power, purpose, and plan that God now has for you as a new person. But maybe you're here or watching or listening and you have not repented of your ignorance. Let me encourage you in this. Don't continue to live in ignorance. Why would we do that? Why would we choose to live that way? But many of us, many people do. But the good news is you can become a new person today. You can start that new life, that new journey today, the life that you've really been looking for and searching for, but you've been facing the wrong direction because you haven't turned yet. Once you make that turn, you'll see what you've actually been missing. Once you turn, I, this, I love this, and I want this, and this is, and then you turn like, whoa, it pales in comparison. The goodness, the glory, the greatness, the power, the love, the relationship with God is nothing compared to this other stuff. And you'll see that if you make that decision to become that new person today. You can become a new person that lives a new life connected to God through Christ. Let's pray. God, we come to you today knowing that we've all, at some point, lived in ignorance. We have all rejected your way for our way. And we're all personally responsible for that ignorance. But we thank you that Jesus came to take that responsibility upon himself even though he never sinned. He can make us brand new people. But in order for that to happen, we must turn and repent of our ignorance. So again, I pray if we have that we, we would just thank you that we are forgiven, that we are cleansed, and that you see us as the righteousness of your perfect sinless son. Not because of our works or our deeds or how great we are, but because of the gift of salvation that we received when we repented of our ignorance. And if we have not turned and repented of our ignorance, may today be the day where we 
make that 180 degree turn. May we experience all that you have for us and live how you designed us to live in perfect relationship with you. God, we thank you and praise you for all you've done today, for your word going forth, for just the spirit that we've sensed here in your presence. And we just pray that we would go forward today in that spirit, in that boldness, in that confidence that we are new people raised to life in Christ. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.